My name is Adam Olson, your host of Innovation Heroes, and um, we're very excited about the, today's episode with special guest, Flying Fish Lab. Through controlled disruption methodology, Flying Fish Lab delivers breakthrough solutions by combining three ways to unlock new possibilities, outside-in, cross-functional co-creation, and silo-functional work. Today we are joined by Mario, the co-founder of Flying Fish Lab, and today we'll be discussing how we can start producing results at a lower cost by implementing the right strategy and implementing tools effectively. So welcome, Mario. Thanks so much for taking the time today to join us. Before we get started, can you share a little bit about Flying Fish Lab and what fires you up most about being a part of the team? Thank you, Adam, for inviting me on the show. I started Flying Fish Lab over six years ago in Singapore because uh, I saw a gap in the market. And uh, combined with you know, previous client-side experience leading brands at Unilever and Nokia, I had a sense that there was a better way to approach innovation challenges. Uh, and so that kind of you know, generated the whole offering that we, that we created for Flying Fish Lab. But really what excites me the most about the Flying Fish Lab team is, sorry, the, the, about the businesses, the team, um, you know, we have incredible talent with uh, some amazing experiences, and that just creates a sort of chemistry that delivers great work. So first and foremost, I think that's that's a big part of it. And then the challenges and the projects that we've had the chance to work on are very exciting, from, uh, you know, carbon negative products, uh, you know, to, to all kinds of industries and, uh, and spaces. So that's, uh, that's a really, um, you know, uh, privileged position to be in, and it's, it's super exciting stuff. Because I've been based out of Singapore for uh, for over a decade, um, and so that was kind of also a, a place where we saw a lot of innovation happening. You know, across Asia, it's been interesting to see. There's a lot of innovation coming out of the U.S., but you know, Asia has had its fair share, especially when it comes to tech. So it's a it's it's a it's a great place to be based and uh, you know to see so much action around and be part of it. Yeah, of course. And so do you find primarily most of your work is over in Asia or are you doing uh, work around the world as well? So most of the work that we do tends to be um, global or regional in nature. So uh, there's there's a lot of most of the work is out of Asia, but usually with a global remit or a regional remit. So regional would tend to be Asia predominantly, but we do uh, a lot of work. I guess about half of what we do would be global. And that could be um, coming from Asia or it could be coming from Europe. That's really not, um, yeah, not, not much of an issue. We've had both cases. Um, but that's kind of part of why we're, we're expanding into Europe because we felt there's definitely um, a, a very interesting space in Europe for us to bring our offering. And, uh, and so I guess you'll be seeing more of us around Europe. Well, we, HeroX has a, a decent presence in Europe as well. So I'm excited to, to you know, have you in that market as well and see what we can partner on, what kind of projects we can get going. But um, maybe you could shed a little bit light uh, on exactly what kind of work you do and how you support mm -hmm. your clients and the relationships you have uh, sure. with Flying Fish Lab. Sure, sure. So what we do is we help companies grow. That's kind of at the heart of what we do. And then it's about how we do it. And for us, you know, it is primarily through innovation. Um, perhaps, though, I should clarify that what we mean by innovation isn't, you know, necessarily only NPD. Sure, you know, we, we do NPD, so coming up with an innovation roadmap uh, with, with a pipeline of products or services for, you know, what you need to launch in the future, that's part and parcel of what we do, bread and butter, I would say. But innovation to us in terms of helping companies and businesses grow goes far beyond that. So, you know, whether it is looking at proposition, it doesn't mean that you have to change the product that you have. Perhaps it's the benefit which you're offering consumers that needs to be, you know, innovated around. It could be around, you know, the way that you um, do your productivity innovation, which is an interesting topic in these times. You know, how do you add value while lowering costs, which seems contradiction, but actually it's a very interesting space. Um, you know, but all kinds of other challenges in terms of you know, how do we innovate from a communication standpoint? How do we innovate in terms of the way we approach the market? So it's primarily around, you know, growth challenges. I need to grow my business, top line or bottom line. Uh, and we do that by having this, as you explained at the beginning, this unique approach, control disruption, which is fundamentally about how do we leverage the client-side expertise that exists in the category. You know, and typically, if you're running a business, it's because you know a thing or two about what you're doing. So we're not there to teach you about you know, insurance or, or paper or you know, shampoo. We're there to bring in something that we call intelligent naivety. So... You know, question some of the things that you take for granted and interrogate possibilities that you hadn't explored. And by, 
you know, overlaying this intelligent naivety onto your category expertise, we succeed in you know, unlocking new possibilities for, for breakthrough solutions uh, across all these different kinds of growth challenges. Um, so I, I guess in, in a nutshell, that's what we do. And that's why I was saying earlier, it's such exciting work and, and it's so varied. I love, I love that word, intelligent uh, naivety. Um, you know, it, it sounds so cool. And, you know, Hero X, we're very focused on creating possibilities as well. You know, my, my position here is possibilities manager. So I love using that word and, and working towards figuring out what's possible. Maybe, could you perhaps give an example of a project you've worked on to really paint the full picture of how, what that looks like uh, sure. when you're helping out a client? Um, in terms of in terms of the approach, I guess it goes back to what I said at the beginning. I felt there was a gap and a need to do things differently. So, um, you know, what we do is the outside in. The first piece is to is to look at the challenges the clients are facing, and you know, people are smart. People in every organization are very smart. They're very good. They're there for a reason. So, if they haven't figured it out. You know, we at Flying Fish Lab are not smarter than they are. So the way to help these teams is to obviously bring in this outside-in perspective. And that, as you know, is kind of where we've, you know, done some work together is in crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is possibly the most powerful way to bring in intelligent naivety. And it is naive because the people who help you from the outside are not experts just like you, right? I mean, they don't understand your brand, your business as well as you do. That's you know, obvious. But by the same token, they have interest, they have curiosity, they have you know their own knowledge. And so when they come to look at your problem, they look at it with this curiosity that leads them to ask these interesting questions that you perhaps no longer ask. And maybe what was true five years ago or 10 years ago is no longer true today. So you might have answered that question in the past. I need it today you might say, hey, Adam, you know, have you considered doing this? And so this first outside in piece is really critical. The catalyst to the next piece that we do around, you know, cross-functional co-creation, which is the second part of what we do. And, and we kind of take that stimuli. We take the Sourcing has done that intelligent naivety has fired up possibilities that the team hadn't considered in the past, and we push that further with the work that we functionally typically it's it's cross functional because we try to involve all of the participants in the innovation process from the onset of the projects that we work. So can these to check the implications of the solutions that we've created before we go on prototype and do you know, all other kinds of things. But basically using the knowledge we have internally to uh, make sure that whatever we've come up with is sell it, we can produce it, we have the regulatory approval, or it looks like we will have the regulatory approval. So it's a, it's a very interesting and different approach, uh, if I have a bias and if I may say so, in the sense that we go from a very creative uh, perspective on, on the problem to a very analytical one when it gets to the solution. So if I take, um, perhaps just to, to bring this to life in a, in a different way, we had a challenge, um, I'm going to take an old, an old project with, with Kellogg's in Australia a few years back, working in uh, muesli bars, okay, perfectly ordinary product. And it was a very commoditized category. And what they were looking for were ways to bring to life new plant-based snacks. And so what, what this, you know, outside in, for example, First Lens created was a set of ideas or possibilities that were centered around how you could challenge so many of the category conventions around shape, around the interaction with your food even, uh, around, you know, borrowing or stealing category codes from other adjacent categories, uh, you know, outside of, of cereal bars to bring novelty into the cereal bar space. So then the work that we did was, was to, to push that further and they've then, you know, taken that forward into the market. So that's just, a, I guess, in a nutshell, a little example of how that intelligent naivety um, enabled them to unlock possibilities that they wouldn't 
otherwise have been able to generate by themselves. And so that was, you know, to a large extent, a contribution that the crowd did in terms of helping open up their minds. And then we were able to push that and kind of finish that and bring it to life. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. What a cool project to, to get to work on because, <laughs> you know, I feel like a lot of food and beverage companies are really looking towards that plant-based, um, those plant-based products these days. How, how long ago did you say that project was? This was a few years ago before COVID. So that's, I'm mentioning it because it's, it's past. So uh, yeah, yeah, it, easy to mention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. You don't want to be shedding too much light on the, the active projects, but you know, that's yeah. something that Hero X um, is, is really passionate about as well. You know, that idea of the, the curse of knowledge that I, the best ideas can come from anywhere that you don't have to be an expert in the industry to, to be passionate about solving a problem or contributing to the solution. And uh, so it's awesome to hear that uh, that's also your your methodology as well and, and your seeing success in, in that as, uh, at the same time so you know it's, it sounds like both of us use crowdsourcing as a tool when we're working with our clients and partners and you know a, one of the things we see a lot is, is people get excited about a new tool or the results that a tool can can create but they it might not ultimately work with their strategy or maybe they haven't fully thought out the strategy uh, before they dive right into a tool. Um, maybe you could touch on a little bit about what you've seen in the, the space on why it's so important to build that foundational strategy and add the tools on top of it or what you see happening. Well, that, that's, a, that's a really fantastic question, Adam, because um, it's something that I guess we also see the same way. You know, um, there is just, so much going on. Um, I, I don't have the, the data to kind of say, you know, I can, I can prove to you that this is the cause. Um, all I have is a few data points, you know, clients we work with, where what we see is that, you know, in a nutshell, in, a, in an oversimplification of reality, it's all down to an aggressive pressure that organizations are putting on their teams. Uh, there's an interesting chart recently shared by Professor Scott Galloway on productivity and how it's, it's, it's risen in the U.S. for the last 40 years, yet it, salaries decoupled from it about 20 years ago. So what this means in a nutshell is that you're extracting more out of each individual. So you know, if, you've, if you've only got a, a finite number of hours in the day, that means that people are uh, plowing through more work in the same number of hours. And what you get with that is less time to go in depth. And so w what's happening, I guess, uh, the hypothesis that we have from this side, from the observation, is that uh, pressured for results, when you see a tool that seems to promise to solve your problems, you jump on it because you, know, you don't have the time to think it through and to think through actually it might or it might not be the right tool for my problem. Uh, and the, the irony, of course, is that if you did set aside the time to think through your strategy, to think through what you're trying to achieve and how to best go about that, actually, you know, the rest happens faster. It enables you to move faster on the execution and choose the right tools and, and go the right way. Um, but I guess that's a little bit the irony. We find ourselves often, you know, with clients who are hoping that these tools can, by miracle, sort of, you know, solve their problems um, because the pressure on organizations is so big uh, that, you know, they, they seem to not have the time uh, to afford the time to kind of spend on strategic thinking and, and planning, which as I said, ironically, I think is, is more needed the more pressure you have. But I guess human behavior, um, you know, tends to go the other way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you know, I would love to be able to have a meeting and, and tell someone that crowdsourcing or running a prize challenge was going to solve all of their innovation problems and, you know, that it would fix everything. But the reality is, you know, we're, we're a very powerful piece of puzzle piece in the, the full puzzle, but it takes a lot of preparation and thought in the behind the scenes before you're able to leverage a tool like absolutely crowdsourcing. absolutely and and i think you know it's it's back to the old uh, einstein quote i don't know if it's true you know don't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree we could say the same thing about tools so you know there's design thinking there's crowdsourcing there's tons of you know ai cool tools out there but that's not the point the point is what do you need to achieve as an organization as a business and as a consequence of your particular problem, need, challenge, um, what's the best way to go about that? We have a pretty blunt approach to that where we will, you know, 
typically tell a client when we find that they're coming to us for the wrong reasons, we will say, uh, this isn't what you need. You know, I'm sorry, here's what you actually need, you know, take it or leave it. I mean, it's, it's our honest opinion, but, uh, you know, we, we won't uh, let you go in blind and say, oh, I'd like to do some crowdsourcing or, some, or, or, or a dragon's den. And we'd say, okay, for that particular challenge, that's not what we'd recommend. So, you know, would you like to reconsider? Because sometimes it's, you know, I've heard that this is a great tool. But actually, once we have the conversation, they'll go, actually, you're right. You know, we should kind of, you know, take a different approach. And, and I guess that's, that's the rewarding bit is, is being able to be very honest and, and to have that feedback from the client that that's valued, that, you know, here's what you have as a problem. That's how we see it. And this is the best way to go about it. There are options, but this is a recommendation. And, and they very often kind of value that. So it is, I think it's something that we need to educate and help the teams on the other side to um, to help them, you know, solve their challenges in the best way possible, not depending on the tools that we have. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, that's certainly our approach at HeroX as well. Uh, and that's why we put such an emphasis on maintaining such a robust partnership ecosystem, because, you know, my favorite part of my job, or one of them certainly, is being able to sit down with potential clients or people that, uh, you know, have an innovation project in mind or something that they're looking to solve and, and getting to hear all the different things that people are up to and, and the, the challenges they're trying to tackle, but not always is it in line with the solution that we provide. And so I love to be able to listen to what their needs are, talk them through it, and then maybe recommend reaching out to one of our partners or someone that has a tool that's more suited to what they're trying to achieve. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, with that, that, I think it's a good segue into the, abundance of tools and technologies out there right now i think the innovation ecosystem is the you know growing at a, a an amazing pace uh, are there certain tools or technologies that uh, you've been really getting excited about or seeing a lot of excitement building around well i guess there's a there's a lot happening as you've said um and so i guess just one uh, specific one that um, that comes to mind is i've seen the beginning of AI tools that are able to actually um, generate creative solutions. Um, so there was one particular one, I, I'm terrible with names, which was a, a tool used by an architectural firm that uh, they basically fed a number of, of uh, you know, models and data into this AI tool. And it, and it came out with a, a model for a building, so an architectural uh, um blueprint for a building and this was kind of built on both data from architecture so you know architectural principles etc but also nature so this ai tool actually created this quite futuristic and very green sort of building for for what you know what the future cities might look like um, and when you get that sort of capability uh, that to me is a really exciting tool to kind of combine with the human creativity and so yeah. i can imagine in the future uh loads of very interesting possibilities to combine AI and human creativity, perhaps in iterations even. Uh, but it's, it's super exciting to think about, you know, what sort of opportunities these new tools can unlock for us and, uh, you know, completely different, therefore completely different solutions to what we have today. Wow, that's, that's so interesting. Now, is that something that Flying Fish Lab is looking to get into, or is that just something that you're excited about that you're seeing kind of happening in the, the ecosystem? So, so I guess it's it's both. Um, so so first of all, it's certainly something that excites me personally. Um, you know, to see how technology can to what we do uh, as, as 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 people as, as individuals, but also um, over the years we've been kind of building a base of knowledge of, of ideas from the crowd. And it's one of the projects that we have to sort of start mining those for richness and depth of insights and, and the new possibilities. So this is based on human creativity, then seeing how AI can further multiply that, so sort of cross-pollinate you know, new ideas out of that. Um, so that's something that we have in the plans, uh, still early days. But it's one of the it's one of the interesting possibilities we're exploring from a from a Yeah, that sounds uh, really interesting. I 
really look forward to following along and seeing you potentially bring that to life. I'm sorry, did I cut you off there, Mario? I, I think no. you cut off a little bit no. there and I, I might have jumped in. Oh, no, I do, but you're back, so I should be back as well. Okay, perfect. Um, well, with the, you know, that being said, which, uh, with, with the excitement of new technologies, you know, there's also the flip side of that, you know, the existing ones that are here now and how we can be leveraging those to, you know, really cut costs and still produce results. And I know with you know, the looming recession that a lot of us kind of have on our mind right now, you're seeing a lot of cuts and layoffs in the tech industries. Things are kind of getting rustled up. And we saw this when COVID first started hitting. A lot of innovation budgets uh, were some of the things that were, were not making the cut um, to be pushed forward. So is there something that the organizations can do to, you know, still push, move the needle on innovation more cost effectively, uh, you know, while still producing results? Like, what do you feel like is the best thing that organizations can do if they need to start kind of trimming back on certain budgets? Uh, absolutely. I guess there's more than one answer to that question. And uh, we have an expression that we use at Flying Fish Lab, which is the yes, if. And so the, the short answer to your question is that if you start looking at the problem differently, uh, you remember what we just said about strategy. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry so much about the tools, but rather what's the challenge? And the challenge is we're in an inflationary, you know, uncertain, possibly recession scenario. So how do we keep growing the business? Basically, how do you keep you know, delighting your customers and how do you keep growing your bottom line? Well, then that requires a fresh perspective. And I guess that would be the kind of perfect uh, uh, environment where you should be looking at productivity innovation. And I, I mentioned that earlier on, which is about how might an organization go about delivering superior results, benefits to your customers while reducing cost at the same time? It's harder. It's definitely harder to do than just, you know, coming up with something that pleases consumers and delights consumers in some um, amply open way, because anything's possible as long as I let my customers here. You're looking at a very narrow space, but then creativity is about constraints. So we've been doing some of that work with um, you know, companies like Mondelez, for example, in, in chocolate, and finding that we've been able to unlock incredible amounts of resource. And so basically, you know, gigantic savings while delivering from a consumer perspective uh, products that are clearly you know above or at least at parity to kind of where they are today so if you can delight your customer and you can you know uh, increase your margin that seems to me the sort of you know challenge that makes sense in, in these recessionary or, or inflationary times um, because you know you're, you're basically locking in or, or you know continuing to win over your your customer and at the same time you're enabling the company to uh, sail through these kind of stormy uh, times. Right, right. And the work you were doing with them, was that more so focused on the actual product or were you doing some packaging work with them? So that was that, that's an interesting question. So, so that work was end to end. So that was from the uh, cocoa bean down to the packaging on shelf and wow. everything in between. So the whole value chain. So that's what's really interesting um, because something that's good at a factory level, for example, might impact the distribution negatively or something that's good for your distribution might impact your, you know, your sourcing negatively. So it's not, it's not always a net, you know, simple, okay, I'm going to cut my packaging. Well, what does that do at the rest of the value chain, the rest of the, you know, the whole end to end. Um, and that's what I think makes these projects uh, both challenging and exciting is when you look at an end to end from an end to end perspective, you start to see some of the knock on effects upstream and downstream. Mm -hmm. And it's by, taking a, again, you know, we're very cross-functional oriented. So it's by taking a complete look at your problem, at your challenge, that we find you're able to unlock possibilities. And going back to, you know, when you spoke about, uh, you know, the right tools for the right problems. So here, for instance, um, you know, we would say crowdsourcing is great, but not for everything, right? So mm -hmm. when, it's, when it involves uh, some dimensions where creativity is useful and is part of the equation, then yes, by all means, let's use crowdsourcing. But when it involves perhaps more analytical aspects of a challenge, then crowdsourcing isn't the right answer for it. So, in, for example, in this project, we had parts of the challenge that were, you know, the outside in, the intelligent naivety was brought in from the crowd, from crowdsourcing, and other elements which, 
you know, weren't relevant to be solved by a crowdsourcing challenge, we found other ways to bring in intelligent naivety, whether that be, you know, analogies from different categories that had similar challenges or other kinds of sources of intelligent naivety. But basically, you know, that's part of the work that we do, which is to understand the problem you have has multiple dimensions. What's the best way to go about, you know, the complete issue that you're grappling with and, and what works for each of those separate dimensions. Man, that's so cool. And that must have been an incredible project to work on where you get to go in and, and really look at that full picture uh, and tackle the problem as a whole. But you must have found yourself in different situations where an organization doesn't really see that big picture and they bring you in for maybe just a smaller portion that you don't, they, they want you to kind of tackle that one individual problem but yes. you don't really get to work on you know, the repercussions that those changes might make. Do you find that that's more so what you're seeing or do most of your clients really see that full picture and they bring you on to, to tackle the, the overall issue? Well, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very varied uh, basket of, of clients. But to answer, <laughs> to answer your question more directly, no. Typically, clients have a, a more focused um, a challenge that they're working on. So it would be an NPD challenge. It would be a, a communication or a proposition challenge or a go-to-market issue, whatever. Um, so it would, it would, in most of the cases, it would be a more, more focused problem. Productivity is a particular kind of challenge that typically um, makes more sense when you look at the entire, you know, end-to-end -end offering because, you know, if you look at one part, as I was just saying, it impacts upwards and down, upstream and downstream. So, you know, you might be saving a lot of money in, in warehousing, but, you know, spending more than that because you're buying the wrong product or you're, you know, you're losing money and you're sourcing. Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess that's an area where it makes more sense to look at it in an integral way because you have to. Whereas if it's, um, you know, perhaps a proposition, what you're really looking at is how might my existing product give consumers a new benefit, and you know the the, the, the very decades old classic is the you know Johnson and Johnson you know baby shampoo, where J and J just went. Actually, it's so gentle that even mom can use it, and all of a sudden, you know, instead of being a shampoo for babies, it's a shampoo for the whole family. You just quadrupled, you know, the potential volume there. Uh, right. That's a a very old and a very basic and brilliant example of proposition innovation, but. You know, it, that doesn't require you to look at the supply chain. That doesn't require you to look at the packaging even. You, you're literally selling the same product for a different reason. And there's you know, tons of examples out there. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So I know we, we touched uh, a few minutes ago on, you know, really making sure that organizations are you know, well prepared to, to use the tools that, the, that make the most sense for their strategy. And one of the most important things that we see for organizations to be set up properly internally um, when looking to kind of dip their toe or explore open innovation is, you know, through challenge design or getting design thinking and really peeling back the layers of what the problem is and what success looks like for them. You know, cause we've seen so many times where an organization says, you know, yeah, let's do crowdsourcing. Let's run a prize challenge. Let's get the crowd to, to solve our problem, but they, they haven't even really thought out what that success looks like for them, what that winning solution looks like for them. And that's why, you know, Hero X, we have some amazing challenge designers on our team to really support in peeling back those layers and really getting to the root of what it is that organizations need to get at. Um, is that some work that you and your team also do at Flying Fish? Um, do you have a different approach that you find works well? Um, so, so the short answer is yes, we do. It's part of the work that we do. Um, different clients come to us uh, with different levels of, um, let me say, readiness um, in that sense. Um, so some of them really thought it through. It's very easy. The organization's aligned. It's clear what needs to be done. And so we can just dive right into the central challenge and it's you know it's it's quite straightforward. Um, even then, we still have a basic setup stage where we'll make sure that you know simple uh, things like are all the stakeholders aligned? You know, okay, you might have clarity, but is there internal agreement within the organization? It's just, just that's just a basic kind of sanity check in terms of setup. There will be other kinds of clients where they will come to us and say, 
you know, this is what we're trying to solve. Um, I'm thinking of, for example, you know, a, a company in, in Asia that was looking to bring in their product from Italy. And um, they said, look, this is what we're trying to do in terms of innovation, you know, tackle markets that are as, as developed as Japan or as uh, initial stages of development as China in that particular category. But we don't feel confident that we understand our consumers well enough. And so here we'll do, it depends on what's needed, but we will do different kinds of work, um, whether it be, you know, insight generation work, whether it's landscape understanding, uh, strategic reviews, even as far as to consider, you know, acquisition targets. Um, we do quite a lot of work in terms of what we broadly call setup. So it could be as simple as some stakeholder interviews. It could be as far as, you know, landscape reviews, you know, tar acquisition targets, et cetera. Basically what for that stage is, as you've said, is to nail down what is it really that we're trying to solve? What is at the heart of, of your challenge? You might have a business issue, but that stated in the same way as your business issue. Uh, and so that kind of brings us back to what we said earlier about once we have that clarity um, about what the central challenge is and turn it into a creative challenge for the crowd to tackle. And, and so you then get into the whole control disruption approach mm -hmm. once we have an understanding of uh, issues that are at the heart of what we're trying to achieve then it, it enables us to move forward yeah it's interesting you touched on the the readiness side of things because you know we obviously see that all the time as well you know every organization is at a different stage in their innovation journey you know so you have some organizations who have full innovation teams and other ones you know that's it's just the ceo looking to tackle a crowdsourcing challenge and, and everything in between and the one thing we've certainly seen i would say in the past two to three years is a huge increase in organizational knowledge on open innovation and people um, you know you, you see more teams uh, and departments around innovation in organizations you've been in the innovation industry for quite some time. Have you noticed an increase in organizational readiness to kind of pursue going open? Um, I, I guess the short answer is yes. Um, and additionally to that, I would say I've got, you know, we all have our biases and, and my bias, having worked in, in, on the one hand, very mature industries like consumer goods and on the other, you know, very uh, high growth industries at the time with, with mobile telephony. Um, I have a sense that it is maturity and commoditization that mostly drive the need for innovation. There is the, uh, obviously, the, the tech breakthrough, but once that happens, it's primarily at the stage where everything becomes similar that you need to differentiate and therefore you need to create new offerings. And I think what we've seen in the last few years is that as our you know, tech revolution matures, we have more effort needed to create something new, to challenge the existing norms and conventions. And so that's what we're seeing, I think, across industries and the ease with which you're able to today you know, launch whether it's a new makeup brand or a new software business, just means that innovation is, is also more accessible. So companies are having to respond to maturing of markets. And so you're seeing more people embracing open innovation and embracing innovation in general. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a great insight. And I think it's a fantastic segue into my heavy hitting final question that I always like to leave with. Uh, I love to get everyone's perspective on, you know, the, the innovation ecosystem where it currently stands as well as you know your vision for what you see the next five years looking like for for us you know we i look back um and i think about you know three years ago people were coming to hero x for for crowdsourcing and thinking it was crowdfunding you know they didn't even really <laughs> they didn't even really know uh you know what what was possible, let alone what we did. And I was actually just at um, the Tread Hunters Future Festival a couple of weeks ago. And it was really amazing being surrounded by so many of the forward thinkers. There were a lot of incredible organizations with representatives present there. And the one thing that really became noticeable was the amount of people that now have innovation specific job titles. Um, a couple of my colleagues attended the Trend Hunter event uh, just before COVID, so back in 2019, and they said, you know, it was almost rare to see people in attendance with, you know, director of innovation or, or CIO or whatever that might be. So as I mentioned before, we're seeing a big uptick in that readiness. I think it's really exciting. I think we've got a really fantastic five years ahead of us. What's your vision for the next five years? Where are we, you know, in, in 2027? 
I think um, it's it's kind of the the evolution of where we are today. So it's going to be faster innovation. That's definitely going to happen. We are becoming addicted to novelty, uh, good or bad. It is what it is. So our customer and our consumers are going to expect faster, more often better services products from us. So that is only going to increase the pressure. And I think the fact that you're seeing organizations, you know, uh, head up a director of innovation or a CIO is exactly the, 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 you know, the signal that they're getting that message. And so five years from now, I think the whole ecosystem is going to be far more energized than it is even today. And I think the, the, the future is hybrid, not just from a work perspective, but also an in innovation when it comes to, you know, tech and people, you know, tools and strategy. I don't think you'll be able to take sides and say the answer is only strategy or the answer is only tools or the answer is only tech or it's only people. You're going to have to combine everything to, you know, to reach uh, the, the, the speed and, and the uh, momentum of innovation that I think customers and consumers are going to expect from organizations. So I think it's, it's exciting and, uh, and we're going to see a lot of um, new and interesting things um, evolve in this, in this open innovation space. Amazing. Well, thank you again very much for joining us today and sharing your insights. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. And, um, I know there's going to be quite a few takeaways from this conversation. So if anybody has any questions or comments following up, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm really looking forward to staying in contact, working together through our partnership, Mario, and uh, watching you grow Flying Fish Lab to see the difference you make in the world. Um, I'll give you a moment for uh, any final words that you might have for our listeners. Yeah, likewise, Adam. I think uh, also apologies to the tech difficulties from my side, but thank you, everyone. Uh, and, and Adam to HeroX, uh, you guys are fantastic partners. This was a wonderful opportunity to have a, a great conversation and share some thoughts and experiences. Um, we look forward to doing some great work together, perhaps more often in Europe now. And uh, who knows, you know, tackling some ridiculously challenging and awesomely fun innovation conundrums because nothing like a good brief to get us all excited. So thank you. <laughs> yes, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to everyone uh, for who joined us live today. Uh, like I mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us a message. Uh, you can tweet at us here. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. Again, my name is Adam Olson. I'm always happy to continue these conversations online. You can catch this session and past episodes at innovationheroes.buzzsprout.com. The link to the recording will be made available along with handy content snippets that you can use to forward your own innovation goals. Our next session is on October 27th, where we will be speaking with Amy Wilson, an experienced consultant who has spent time at Booz Allen in the White House and has founded and ran accelerator programs in North America. We look forward to being with you then. My name is Adam Olson from HeroX, and I'm the host of Innovation Heroes. These episodes cover all things innovation, crowdsourcing, and remote work. It's time to open up the airways, share strategies, engage partners, and leverage the power of crowd intelligence. We're looking to help expedite solutions to pressing problems facing every level of organizations, individuals, and the world. The key word here is open. We're bringing innovator powerhouses, our innovation partners, and remote work legends into the spotlight. Thank you for being a part of the solution. Reach out anytime at possibilities at heroex.com.